Um, so Jasmine is going to talk to us today about the sickle fin lemon shark population surrounding Curious um, Marine National Park. Um, Jasmine is the science coordinator for Global Vision International on Curious Island. And she is a marine biologist and climatologist. And she, her main areas of research are focused on lemon shark, the nesting behavior, and nest succession of and on beach profiling. And so uh, let's go hand over to you to get us going. Fantastic. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to be chatting today about the sicklefin lemon shark population surrounding Curious Marine National Park. And just a very quick uh, background of where Curious is. We are located just off of the coast of Pralin and we are the fifth largest granitic island with a total size of about 2.9 kilometers squared. We have very unique biodiversity on the island. We are one of only two islands that has the Coco de Mer and the giant tortoises all on one island. We also have some very important hawksbill sea turtle nesting sites on the island as well as well as mangroves, seagrass and coral habitats, which are perfect habitats for the sicklefin lemon shark pups. You can see in this image here on the screen, uh, Pralin is just the island at the bottom there, whereas Curious is the one in the middle. And the yellow line all around the edge is the boundary of the Marine National Park. The whole channel between Curious and Pralin is protected. 200 meters off of the back um, of Curious is also protected as well. So in total, including land and water, it's 14.7 kilometers squared. So why we do the research that we do and why it's so important to uh, protect the sharks. Uh, there's uh, many, many beneficial impacts on ecosystems that sharks give. Um, they prevent trophic cascades. If you don't have those top apex predators to control the prey population, those populations get out of control and have a cascade effect down the ecosystem. Um, Counterintuitively, you might think sharks eat all fish, but no, in fact, they prefer to eat the slow, sick fish. They won't waste their energy on those healthy, quicker fish. And of course, tourism. The value of a shark over its lifespan is uh, millions of dollars, whereas compared to um, just a few hundred dollars if it's caught and sold at market. So there's many, many different economical and ecological reasons to protect these sharks. So a little bit about the sicklefin lemon shark that we do our research on. So they are in the Carcharhinidae which is the largest shark family. Um, usually within this family, it can be quite hard to differentiate between the different species, but lemon sharks are actually very unique and we can tell them apart quite easily. Um, and that's because they have two similar sized dorsal fins at the top there. And so that's pretty much what we use our key identification. They also have a really lovely lemon color to it in the light as well. They can be found in the blue areas on the map that's just to the right. So that's the rim of the Indian Ocean, North Australia, Indonesia, Japan, and the middle of the Pacific as well. They do frequent shallow waters, um, which means they are in close proximity to humans, which makes them vulnerable to overfishing and exploitation. And actually there's evidence of extinction in places like India and Thailand and parts of Indonesia as well. So a little bit more about the habitat that we believe that these um, sharks frequent. We have a zoomed in picture of the east part of Curious right here. Um, and again, the yellow line down the side is just that boundary. If we go to the top of the map there, we see Grand Anns and Anns Papai, which is our first and second most popular turtle nesting beach. And just off the coast there, there's coral reefs and a mixture of seagrass as well. We come on down into the middle of Curious and we have what we call the turtle pond. And this is where we do um, a large portion of our pit tagging survey and get our research from. 
in the turtle pond, it's a mixture of sandy bottom as well as seagrass and there's loads of mangroves in there as well. And the maximum depth in the turtle pond is about 1.5 meters. And then if we just go back up to the top of that map there, the deep waters range from about seven meters to 27 meters as well. But it's in the turtle pond that we collect um, the pit tagging survey data. Now, what this is, is it's where we pop a passive integrated transponder, which is just an electronic tag with an individual ID number, and we pop it into the shark. And the aim of this is to inform sustainable management of the Curious Marine National Park. We can't come up with effective management strategy if we don't know the basics of the population and the dynamics that they work in. Other information that we're looking to gather is an estimate of the population size, the growth rate through biometric collection, as well as the gender ratios, condition factors, population structures and dynamics, and population genetics through DNA sampling. And a few of these results. In the entire study, we have caught 745 individual captures. So that's from 2014, when the study began, all the way until our last survey, which was just last week. We also have 196 recaps, which makes it 27% recap rate. We do believe that the annual um, population estimate is between 255 and 661. Um, and we're in the process of redefining this number with our acoustic tracking program, which I'm going to be going on to in a minute or so. We have had consistent growth rates and population dynamics patterns every single year. And what we're actually finding is that um, the beginning of popping season, when the mums come in to give birth, the first three or four months is actually several hundred sharks in our mangroves. And then towards the end of the three or four months, there's a huge decline. And what we believe is happening is that the healthy ones are learning to hunt um, and the ones that don't essentially drop out of the population, but they do end up leaving. Our last season, we actually had a record breaking season and we got 171 individual captures as well as 45 recaps as well, bringing it to a 26% recap rate overall. This is such a fantastic and important survey and it's important research as well. However, it does have um, some limitations. It's impossible to know the proportion of total population sampled because pit tagging is essentially it's just taking a snapshot of a small proportion of the population because we only sample a small part of the habitat. All we sample is the turtle pond. We're not going up the coast. We're just going into the turtle pond to collect this research. So that means that we're not getting other important information such as their home range, their activity space, their habitat use, habitat extent. And we also don't know if the individuals remain within the boundaries of Curious Marine National Park. They could be leaving and then re-entering. We don't know that. And that's exactly why we created the next part of the Lemon Shark project, which is, the, which is the acoustic tracking. So what we have done is deploy 12 acoustic receivers on the ocean bed, and I will show you a map of them in the next couple of slides. And we've also surgically implanted 20 acoustic transmitters into neonate sharks. Um, and this gives us continual trackings of the movements of the sharks over a period of six months. And really what we want to um, get out of this data is we want to again refine the current estimates of the population and quantify home range and activity space and really have a look and assess is the marine park effective in the critical early life stages of these neonate sharks. So these were our deployment sites originally. This is just range testing. We can see in green, um, we have the transmitters not implanted in sharks at this point. And in, red, um, in yellow, we have the receivers. We pop some in shallow, some in deep, all the way up the coast, as well as in the turtle pond where we do our pit tagging study. 
Again, this is just range testing of the deeper ones. We went all the way up the east coast of Curious, even around the back called Point Rouge. However, um, after range testing and deliberation, we decided to squeeze them all together to make an impenetrable boundary for the sharks as well, so that they wouldn't slip through unnoticed. We would know if they were leaving the national park, but we still kept six deep receivers, um, some being as deep as 27 meters, and we kept six shallow um, receivers in as well. And of course, some in the turtle pond where we absolutely know um, that they are frequenting. So how we went about implanting these transmitters, um, we combined it with our pit tag uh, survey as well. So we went out at the same time. And what we would do, we catch a shark and if it was appropriate for the survey and appropriate to have a transmitter, if it was healthy, we would put it in our workup station like, in, like is in the image. We would turn it upside down, which is an induction of tonic immobility. And it's essentially puts the shark into a hypnotic state. So it's as good as anesthesia really. We then place a small incision on the ventral side, insert the transmitter into the body cam cavity, and then we close um, the wound up with three sutras. We'd also continuously replenish that water in the trough to keep those oxygen levels up. And then it would be out back in the water in minimal time, about four or five minutes in total. So the results that we have seen and gotten so far, 12 receivers have successfully been placed down on the ocean bed. 20 transmitters have been implanted into the sharks, which happened in October 2019. 13 of the 20 sharks were either recaptured or detected on at least two receivers, confirming that the surgeries were successful. And all surgery wounds were healed if we did recapture them as well. And we have continued detections of multiple individuals using manual tracking uh, when we go out and do the pit tag survey. We also have some further results and they are that we have recorded a total of 329,208 detections in total from the 20 sharks between October 2019 and May 2020. And of all of those detections, only 1,203 were recorded in the deeper water, which suggests a very strong preference for the shallow water habitats, um, which confirms our hypothesis as well. And also at least four individuals appear to remain active within range of the receivers, which also correlates with observed catch rate patterns during our pit tagging survey. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on that much of our data is still under analysis, but this will be more, uh, this will be completed and confirmed by the end of this month. Uh, so I can't give too much away at this point in time, but we can confirm that the sharks do in fact use all of the habitat mentioned. And because of this, we are working on improving our population size estimates. Awesome, thank you for listening. Thanks, Jazzy. Great. Uh, it's really great to see how previous work is building on new work and just to see that long term stuff happening and that technology is improving and we're learning more. It's great. Right. Um, I don't know. There are no questions for Jazzy. Anybody? I'll leave you one quick minute um, to ask any questions about that. Um, I'll just maybe ask quickly what is, you know, so. I suppose you're wanting this information to feed into the current management plan, future management plans. Like, so how, what is, what do you envision happening with, with this data that's being collected in terms of the actual impact it will have? Right. No, that's a great question. And essentially a big overarching question for us is, um, is the Marine National Park being effective? Do the boundaries need to be made bigger? That was a huge question for us. And with the East Coast boundary, what we really wanted to find out is if they're passing through the East boundary and do we need to widen that boundary? And again, I can't go too much into the details because they're not been published quite yet, but that's what we're hoping to uh, really see. Do Is the Marine Park effective with the boundaries it has or does that need to be expanded? Right. Um... 
And then we have one, is there a sex difference um, about the sharks remained or moved away from the research range? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Um, the participants asked if you noticed a sex difference between the sharks that remain or move away from where we you're doing not, the... No, not as such. There's no sex difference. And we did pop exactly 10 in males and 10 in females but no difference so as of yet. Okay, and then uh, another one, it's good to see them popping up now. Um, would you think it would be effective to increase, oh, where does it go? Oh yes, uh, to increase the receiver array, maybe towards the west, past the GBI base or other waters of the <sighs> It, that's a tough one. We do know that most of the population is actually on the East Coast and on the South where the GBI base is, it's a much, much smaller population. So right now we're just concerned with um, the biggest population on the East Coast. I'm not sure if it would be worth moving down to the side quite as much. We see significantly less down on the side near our base. Great. Um, I think somebody wants to know if there's plans to expand, but I mean, I think much of what you've said probably relates to that. Right? Yeah, I think that one covers it. And then somebody said uh, that you, it seems that you only get recordings uh, for 13 to, from 13 to 20 receivers. Mm -hmm. um, if so, why? So that's because we think they might have moved out of the boundary of the park. But again, we can't be sure. We're still analyzing that data, but we've got that data just from manual, the manual tracking when we were doing the pick tag surveys. So again, that number could change, which was still under, under analysis. Great. And then the last question, uh, is um, just somebody asking about uh, shark pup poaching and whether you guys do any work to prevent that. Yes, so because uh, we share the island with SMPA, they, the rangers do such a fantastic job of patrolling the areas to keep away poachers. Um, so we're hoping that the numbers of poaching are down. And again, they're doing patrols as much as they can to um, keep away the poachers and it's very rare actually that we do see poaching of the uh, shark pups out here so that's good. Great thanks.